Hello and welcome back to Ray's Gaming, welcome back to Baldur's Gate 3. After the recent PlayStation release of the game, we have a pile of new players getting into the game. For these new players, we made an important things not to miss guide for Act 1. But now we're here for Act 2. We aim for these videos to be as spoiler avoidant as we can make them, but we will be referencing important areas and I will warn you ahead of time. And hopefully, whether you're brand new or you've been playing for a while, this video could be both interesting and useful to you. With that explained then, let's begin. We'll work our way through Act 2 in terms of location that you'll come across in reasonable order. Starting with the one all new players are going to need to know, which is the first thing you deal with in the Shadow Cursed region, the invasive mechanic that you need to overcome using moon lanterns and other methods. However, by carrying a moon lantern, you need to hold the thing which can be invasive on the game itself. Thankfully, there's a quick trick you can do to bypass all of that and the curse itself using your first moon lantern, which will likely come from the convoy ambush southeast of Last Light. After you first reach the Last Light Inn and meeting the leader there, you'll go back over the bridge you used to enter and speak with the guards there. They basically direct you to the ambush location. Go there and defeat the ambush one way or another and get the lantern. Then just interact with it. You'll find that there's actually a pixie trap within it. Free the pixie and have it repay you by giving you a bell, which is just now an item you can click on and use to mitigate the curse for you and your whole party in the form of a buff. It's much better than holding a lantern. You just need to beg the pixie to help you in the future uses, which is no big deal. After that, there's two people I want to mention in the last light in area itself, the quartermaster and the blacksmith. Firstly, the quartermaster. She sells some really good gear, but one item that's ridiculously good and somehow a green is one I never noticed in my first playthrough. Now, obviously she sells the incredible Shield of Devotion and the Incandescent Staff. Both are clearly good, they're purples, and both have strong effects you're most likely going to want to buy and use. However, it's one of the greens down below that's truly insane, the Cloak of Protection. By wearing it, you get a plus one to your AC and your saving throws, which is so strong because anyone can wear these cloaks with no real downside, so any build or party member should be benefiting from that perk. And since it's only a green, it's really cheap for how good it is. On the other side of the yard then, you've got the Blacksmith that you met in Act 1. Now he's got access to a better forge, he offers you some more services, including making the Hell Dusk armor set. But what it really means is the flawed version. This is the helm, chest, and gloves, and honestly, even though they're flawed, they're really good, especially the gloves. The issue here is he wants three infernal iron to make all three pieces. These items you find all over the game, but you can find an easy three in Act 1 and even more in Act 2. Once you have three, you can immediately use them to craft the set, but here's how to find three in Act 1. Firstly, there's the easy one in the Blighted Village. It's just in the blacksmith's cellar, found in a chest on the ground within this room. The second would be found in the Goblin Camp, the leader, that Red Hob Goblin. He has this stash of loot behind him, behind a gated room. And if you steal the key from him or just kill him and loot it, you can go open up that and then loot the stash, which again has that next iron in it. Finally, there's a hidden sort of thief Zentarim base to the northwest of the wilderness by Walkeen's Rest. Head into the small building on the northwest side of this area and work your way down into the cellar. Deal with the people within through conversation or combat and ultimately make your way to the end of the cave on the north side. There you'll find multiple lock rooms and within you'll find that last iron that you're after. You might have found more in Act 2 yourself, but again, the moment you have three, you can take them to the blacksmith and get all the gear. Moving on from that, there's one weapon that I missed in my first playthrough, the Ritual Dagger of Shah. It's a magic dagger that deals necrotic damage if you're not in direct sunlight, which can be very strong in various sections of the game, and it's just found in a Sharon Sanctuary, hidden in the middle of the Wraithwind Town. There's a big statue with a secret underneath. You need to interact with the plates around the statue's base and pass three checks you'll reveal the stairs down to the room below, which then has that massive statue of Shah. You'll see the dagger just there, but it's a very good idea to use Shadow Heart to interact with it if you don't have someone with like history or religion to identify what's going on here. Shadow Heart will know that she needs to make a sort of cut and blood sacrifice to satisfy the situation, and that will spawn in some extra goodies, some useful scrolls and potions, which are well worth having, and obviously it's very easy to get, as well as the dagger, which when you pick up, you will trigger a fight. Once you clear that, you can leave with all the loot in hand. At this point, you know, there's a bunch more things I could talk about in the open region of Act 2, but I have covered them in a variety of videos, so I'm going to move on to the Moonrise Towers secrets now. Moonrise Towers is an important story location at the southern point of the map. 
we can simply enter by pretending to be an absolute, speaking with the NPCs within before progressing any combat story. It's important to make the most of this kind of brief period of pre-combat, so let's do that. Firstly, upon entry in the hall, there's two vendors, a bugbear and a gnome that sell some really good stuff. The main two items I want to highlight though are the halberd of vigilance and the drakethroat glaive, which serve a very similar purpose to one another. In short though, the halberd is a popular and recommended by many item and is worth getting, but it seems that the glaive is arguably better. This is due to the fact that it has its own ability to enchant itself to a plus three weapon up from a plus two and then add a one to four element damage on the attacks. You'd think this would require say concentration, but it just doesn't. So it's kind of insane and overshadows the still very good halberd by comparison. After that, there's a well-known thing that I need to include in a video like this, and it's the potion of everlasting vigor, which results in a permanent buff to your strength for whoever drinks it. Not something you don't want to miss, and is gained by simply talking with the strange blood-interested NPC on the ground level, Araj. You need to bring Asterion with you because she becomes very interested in him. Talk with her and agree to let her take some of your blood, and then she'll want to talk about Asterion. Convince him then to drink her blood, which she somehow wants and she'll reward you with the potion for that plus two strength permanently. Just be sure to convince him well and apologize after if you want him to still like you. Next, we have something I completely missed in my first playthrough, a potential permanent buff for Gale, or just a useful summon. In the secret room of Balzahar the Necromancer, on the higher level of the Moonrise Tower, there's a green skull sigil on the table. To get in this secret room, you need to find the heart in the room and place it in the pedestal that reveals it, but then have Gale interact with the green sigil on the table and choose to erase it. Gale will now be buffed with Mistress Benevolence, which is a buff that causes Gale to have advantage on concentration saving throws, which is going to be really good. Gale is always casting concentration spells, it's very good. Obviously, you'll be using haste all the time, it's one of the best. Giving him a way to keep haste buff and dodge the concentration breaks, that's going to be a good thing. However, there's an issue with this buff. It seems like it's meant to be permanent, but it clears after a long rest. With that in mind, you might want to do this buff right before, say, a big fight. It seems like something that should be permanent or lasts a lot longer, and there are reports that this is actually bugged, so we'll see if that changes. Alternatively, you could use a dead pixie in the room and a broken moon lantern you find in there on the sigil. Combine them and craft a new moon lantern, which also results in an interesting summon. Another thing I missed myself, that shadow lantern wraith summon. Once per long rest, you can summon it and it makes for quite the strange summon. So this is a choice you can make, but be aware that Mistra is not going to like the one where you make a monster. Finally, for the pre-event Moonrise stuff, there is the basement below the prison. If you choose to free the prisoners within, you can get yourself an outrageously good magic robe for casters. You need to get the hammer of the gnome who requests it so he can break into the caves behind their cells and escape. At that point, you need to defeat or hold off the guards so well that everyone important makes it out alive, resulting in maximum rewards. If you successfully kill the guards, it somehow won't actually cause any alarm for Moonrise Towers, so you can do all that without any major consequences. Anyway, save everyone and go back to the Lights Inn, where you'll find the people you save. The gnome, when you speak with him, gives you some gold as a reward, while the tiefling, she'll give you that incredible robe, the potent robe. Okay, the last section I want to highlight in Act 2 would be Under Moonrise Towers. This means it's right after the main event that's going to push the story to its conclusion in this region. So, big spoiler warning. So, after fighting Thorm, you'll expose the secret that is Under Moonrise, the Illithid colony. Within that colony, you find a variety of interesting things, but there's two I want to mention. First, the permanent summon, Uz, is a little brain thing with legs that you find in a chamber in the middle of this region. A mind-muddled slave sort of tends to these horrible creatures and he mentions that there's one that's not sort of behaving right. It's not obeying him. So if you convince him to take it away, he'll just let you free it and have it. And as easy as that, it becomes the ability on your hotbar to summon it whenever you want, which works as a useful meat shield with some useful skills. Second and last down here that I want to mention is the permanent buff that results in permanent advantage with intelligence saving throws, which is another thing I missed. You'll find in one of the main rooms of the colony a head and an interface next to it. This is the mind archive interface and to use it you need to find mind items like waking fresh dark or true minds and insert them into the console you can get some interesting conversations through that but we care about the one near the blade of oppressed souls room basically you need the waking mind found after completing the necrotic lab puzzle which is basically having you connect all these colors together on a sort of big brain revealing the room behind it where you pick up the waking mind with it in hand we can return to the mind archive interface from earlier and using the 
waking mind will end up speaking with a monk who begs our help. Do what they ask and purge their mind and you'll receive the mind barrier buff. This is what results in that strong as hell buff and it's certainly something that you'll want rather than miss out on in that area. But there you have it, Act 2 and its variety of important things not to miss, with some incredible items, as well as some potent buffs for your playthrough. A good chunk of these I missed myself, so I do hope it helped you. If you guys have more things that you think people should not miss, that are a secret somewhat in Act 2, then drop it in the comments, maybe you'll help someone. For now then, I've been Hollow, you've been you, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Josh, Cotton, and Hollow with the videos Dropping the humor like a hammer on your tippy toes Bringing entertainment on a daily arrangement To take our insanity and turn it into entertainment Yes, I said entertainment twice To reiterate that it is nice To look into your faces on a mostly daily basis When you let us in your homes to make the whole world a stage Is, uh, goodbye